Can-Am connection, fluent and chill. What's going on, Jay? How you doing, man? Can-Am. I like that. <laughs> I do Listen, like I, that. You know, I, you know, I stole it from wrestling, <laughs> but I, I like it. So we've got, you know, every show's a great show. I feel like I say it every time, but it's it's true. It's true. Mm-hmm. We got mail drop. Three really good questions from our listeners and viewers. We're going to talk about DeMar DeRozan, MVP. I don't know why we, uh, I was fighting it for a while and I'm not fighting it tone. I was more poo pooing it like, yeah, but it was one of, it's, it's one of those conversations that now must have to we have, it, to, it, we it, have it. to have it. We have we to have, have, to have it. Have this, we have to have this conversation. Every week we've been talking about, we've done the quarterbacks. We've mm-hmm. done wide receivers. Now mm-hmm. we're going to do the top five free agent running backs and where they should land ball carriers but we're gonna start we're gonna start there's a conspiracy and we do a conspiracy you know every single week between our three shows one episode of the three a week we always do a conspiracy we've done listen just to recap we've done jordan's flu game we've done jordan's first retirement Mm -hmm. we've done did a man really land on the moon is -hmm. the earth flat We've done a lot of conspiracies. I think actually we did to the frozen envelope, mm-hmm. Patrick Ewing and the Knicks. All of those ones and more. And we're going to continue to do more. Mm-hmm. But all of them have one thing in common. We've all heard of these conspiracies before. We've had conversations. We've seen information. The Wilt 100. That's another good one that we've done. That's a really good one. So here's the thing about this one. We talked about it last week almost as a you know, I kind of just threw it there, threw it out there in the sense that Joan Howard was suspended after kind of that, you know, the after the game, they're doing the, the line and he didn't like a, a timeout that uh, in a blow that was called and he reacted and swung. And I brought up, oh, well, he probably has PTSD from, from Chris Weber, from Chris Weber in the NCAA finals against North Carolina when he calls a timeout that they didn't have cost him the game. Mm-hmm. And the reason I bring that up is. I'd never heard this conspiracy before. So all those other ones we've talked about, we've heard about. That one, through this one, was sparked by my comment about ESPTSD from timeout. And someone sent me, said, hey, it's not just PTSD. There's a conspiracy there that you guys should talk about. And I said, whoa, what kind what, of conspiracy? What, what are you talking about? Me. Chris Weber threw that game on purpose. Uh, Here's one of the best college basketball players, maybe mm -hmm. ever, but at least in Michigan, obviously. Mm -hmm. Athletic and intelligent. Listen to the way he speaks. He's not a dumb guy. He's a smart guy. He knows basketball. Mm -hmm. He's on his way to the NBA. And, And he threw the game on purpose. I said, why? Why would that happen? So before I go into the details of the why... Mm-hmm. Have you let me ask you because I do I we get comments that I do too much talking, so I'm gonna stop for a little bit. What about you? Have you heard of this this conspiracy? Of this, what are um, your what are your thoughts before, initially? Before you bring this, before you bring this to me, this has never been anything that, like this that has crossed my mind because they was in the national championship the year before and they got smacked real good by Duke. So the consensus was the whole crew was coming back the next year. This was before the one and done's. The whole crew was coming back the next year, and everybody thought, okay, Michigan's winning it this year. They got their whole crew back. They was in the national championship. They're better. And Chris Webber is unanimously the best player in the country. So it's not a question of whether or not there's this guy. Because there was a time where you could have have an argument that, you know, Jamal Mashburn might be this guy or or, uh, Hardaway or – there was other guys in the conversation tone, but for the most part, Chris Webber was the best player in the country. So they had the best player in the country. They had their entire five coming back the next season. Michigan was considered the best team in the country. They had a dogfight in the NCAA tournament where they had some really tough games, but I was convinced that they were winning it. So the idea that he's going to throw it, I'm very interested to, to hear the logic on this. All right. So for those that don't know, it's about we're talking about the Fab Five, right? Five mm-hmm. freshman starters. I don't think it was done before. I don't think it's been done since. Mm-mm. So let's talk about it. So here's here's the background. If I'm going to say a name, tell me if you've heard this name, Ed Martin. I do, Ed Martin. That was a uh, that was Weber's guy. Weber, 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 and Jalen Rose were Jaylen getting Rose, money, yeah. 
and gifts and stuff from Ed Martin. In fact, afterwards, mm-hmm. right, Chris Weber lied and was found guilty of perjury that he mm-hmm. did lie, that he was accepting cash and, and whatever, him and Jalen from Chris Weber. And we know that's a big no no back Jaylen then. Jalen didn't lie though. J- no, Jalen no, didn't, didn't lie. Um, yes, Jalen didn't lie, but they were both getting money. They big money Ed money. was what Jalen Rowe called yeah. him. Big, big money Ed. Now mm-hmm. they could have today they probably just signed an NIL uh deal with him. However, back then you couldn't take money, gifts, that sort of mm-hmm. thing. So Ed Martin's giving money to Chris Weber and Jalen Rose while Weber's a student at the University of Michigan. We know that that's a no-no. Weber, actually, apparently, he was Weber was even getting money. Detroit County Day, the school he went to, Country Day, excuse me, the high school. Apparently, he knows Ed Martin from then. Mm-hmm. So, so he knows this guy, Ed Martin. Ed Martin's giving him money. Martin runs, if you don't know, an illegal gambling racket. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, he's also an employee at Ford. I don't mm-hmm. know that that's relevant. However, it is relevant. I'm, just, I'm going reason, through the bullet points. <laughs> yeah, that's relevant. Ahead. The reason why that's relevant because that's the cover. So I'm a right. drug dealer, and I already I got a day job, but my, yeah. my but real money's coming from drug dealing. So that's the cover. So to your point uh, that they're all coming back, the next year Weber Weber was already planning to declare for the 1992-93 NBA draft. Mm-hmm. We know that Weber was one of the best college athletes of all time, physical, mm-hmm. mental. I mentioned that already. So here's what we know so far. So Ed Martin has his day job at Ford as his cover. He's running mm-hmm. an illegal gambling racket. He's paying off Jalen Rose and Chris Weber. Chris Weber apparently since since high school, so even before the college days. Mm-hmm. Okay. Ed Martin had a lot of money tied into this game. Who was the heavy favorite to win that game? Michigan. Michigan. Mm-hmm. So if I were to put a huge bet on UNC, I'd probably get a really big payday, wouldn't I? You would. So now if I've got Weber basically under my thumb a little bit because I've been giving him money. We mm-hmm. all know that's a no-no. But he's going to the NBA draft. I'm going to lose my guy now. I don't have Chris Weber anymore. He's going to the NBA. I need one last big payday. Mm-hmm. So... He says to Weber, you're going to lose this game. I'm going to bet big on UNC. I'm going to get my one big guy. Or I'm going to go tell the NCAA, your school, whoever will listen about what's been going on. That's going to ruin your college. They're going to take away all your stats. Like You know the ramifications back then. Players were very scared of that happening. So let me pause there for a second. Now do you, do you see that there's a possibility or do you want more? No, I think that there's a possibility with that right there, but I don't think that's enough. And the reason why I don't think that's enough is simply because why are we just doing it with the NCAA championship? If this was going on in the NCAA championship, this had to have been going on throughout the season. You you can't just come to me at the Mm -hmm. end of the season and say, I need you to throw a game. Of all the games that I've played and, and of all the of all the games that I've played and all the games we won and lost and all the money that could have been potentially made, you come to me at the end of the season, the most important game, and say, yo, you got to throw this game or I'm going to the NT. No. Mm-mm. How do we know? I guess we got to go back and look. It might not have been throwing games, but it, there could have been point shaving, mm-hmm. which which was very common, mm-hmm. which was very common. So here's not the ridiculous. scenario. Mm-hmm. There's 20 seconds left. It's the final game, right? Weber has a chance to directly, directly influence the outcome. Michigan has no timeouts left. Pat Sullivan misses his second free throw with 20 seconds to play. Mm-hmm. Weber appears. I don't know if you see that. Remember the clip, but he appears to call a timeout, but the ref doesn't see him. Mm-hmm. He then travels. We all saw that, but the ref mm-hmm. doesn't see that either. So mm-hmm. what does he do? Well, he starts dribbling down the court. Well, where does he dribble? To his bench. Straight into the corner, into a double team, into a trap, where some say Michael Talley, if you watch the the the, uh, the video, is telling him to call a timeout. Some say he's part of this. Mm-hmm. He's in this. He was also one of Ed Martin's guys, apparently, who's telling him to call a timeout. So what does he do? He turns, calls his timeout. No timeouts, technical foul, North Carolina wins. Listen, we could go through probably an hour of this, and I gave you kind of the short version because 
I want to hear your thoughts. So let me just kind of break it down again. Chris Weber is taking money from Ed Martin since high school illegally. We know we know that's a fact. He we know that he went and testified and lied that he was doing it. So no offense to Chris Weber. We know that he's a liar, at least in that particular case. He was found guilty of doing that, of perjury. <clears throat> we know that Ed Martin obviously had an illegal gambling ring. We know that. All this stuff so far For is fact. fact. For this is speculation. This is right. not speculation. This not is fact. None of, none of this is speculation. This is all fact. We know that Chris Weber was going to go into the draft, which he did for nine, in the 92-93 season. So Ed Martin mm-hmm. was now going to lose his guy. If he was, we don't. this we don't know. Was he point shaving? Mm-hmm. Was he doing all that? But we know this. If you've got a, a player of Chris Weber's caliber kind of in your crew, you get a lot of benefits in other ways too, right? Correct. So that being so, that's the only thing we don't know if he was point shaving. We know that we know for a fact Michigan was the heavy, heavy favorite mm-hmm. in Vegas. And if I'm running an illegal gambling ring and I have an opportunity, even if it is just one game, I have an opportunity to get the outcome of the national title game where a team that I can influence is the heavy, heavy favorite. Is it beyond the realm of possibilities that an unscrupulous man who has an illegal gambling ring and influence a game to get one big payday? And during that time, the NCAA tournament was a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal it's, now. It's still now, but I've, yeah. But it was a big deal back then. Not only was it a big deal, it was a big deal because guys stayed in school. Guys didn't just come right out of school. It wasn't one and done. Even though right. Chris Webber, even though Chris Webber did two years, guys stayed in school. So the competition level was higher. Now, here's my rebuttal to this. Well, number one, Chris Webber calling a timeout. That wasn't an aberration. Well, what do you mean that wasn't an apparition? Well, we saw Chris Webber in the pros when things got serious and things got tight. He folded. That's who he is. But was that a creation of what happened that day? Well, Chris Webber said, he said, this was in high school. He said, I have succumbed to the pressure in the past. That's been my biggest problem. So right then and there, that tells me, one of it doesn't tell me one of two things. It tells me one thing. He can't handle it. So we'll start there. Or can, I got to pause you. Or does it I'm tell listening. you? Or does it tell you that he's been on the take multiple times and that's his cover? No, Tom. Because if he was on the take, then he would have gave it up already. Do you if think? you can't handle, absolutely. If you can't handle it, he would have gave it up already. Okay. Him, get, him getting that rebound, which I I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Him getting that rebound and dribbling. To the sideline, so he looked like a deer in headlights. He couldn't get that ball away from him fast enough. That's number one. Number number two, Tony. I'd like for you to take out your time machine and rewind the clock back to 1982. Georgetown is going against North Carolina, who was also in the national championship at that time. All right, Michael Jordan just cashes an 18 footer to put them ahead. They got downtown Freddie Brown as their point guard. Freddie Brown's coming up, and we're going to get a score because we got a score, too. They just scored. We got a score. So what does downtown Freddie Brown do? He throws the ball to James Worthy. For those that don't know, James Worthy was on North Carolina. He does not play for Georgetown. He does not play for Georgetown. No, he doesn't. And and he doesn't throw the ball to James Worthy like he got trapped or something like that, and James Worthy just stepped in. No, James Worthy is standing behind him. He thought James was with Georgetown, turned around, and threw him the basketball, which means to me, New Orleans is one of those places where there's supernatural energy going on. So maybe, possibly, we may have had a reoccurrence of what happened in 82 in 1993. Oh, I thought maybe you were going to say he saw a ghost of a Georgetown player. In it might, that, that, that's not ridiculous neither, Tone. We might have something <laughs> like that going on. Now, I will say this, that I'm not buying the logic of... Chris Webber being bought because we would have heard about that. I was over 30. We're talking almost 30 years ago. If he was bought, we would have heard about it because we heard about Mr. Stephen Headache Smith that he got bought when he was at Arizona State. We found out about that. So that's not something, and especially University, University of Michigan is not only a big time program, they were marching through the tournament those two years. They had one of the they had one of the best runs, two two-year runs in the history of any program. So if that was going on, 
I think we would have been heard about that. Absolutely. Well, but but we're talking about a guy who, well, Ed Martin's not going to say anything because he got the no. big payday from it. Correct. Chris Weber's not going to say anything because we know he'll lie on the stand. Mm -hmm. So, but with that, but but with that being said, Tone, we don't need him to say anything. You have enough people who can dig and dig deep to find out where this is coming from, and you know this is just as well as I do, Tone. When you got something like that going on, what's the first thing? What's the cardinal rule? Follow the money. Follow the money. And right. if, if that was going on, follow the money, and we would have found out exactly who was doing this. And I'm th I, there was no evidence that that was going on, so okay. I'm more I'm, I'm more so inclined. Give me, to give me give me your one out of ten. One being no way. Ten being yep, it absolutely happened. One. 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 I so no, no no chance no chance no way no how because we would have we, we would have there would have been some tone this is the first time in almost 30 years that i've heard anything like this so you're I'll the say, first person to bring I, well, i'm not i'm bringing it to you because it was the first time anyone's ever brought right. it to me too i never even thought about the idea of him skimming never so i i read it and here here's my thing here's my theory based on one i've never heard of it i never mm -hmm. thought of it i just thought here's a guy who got flustered I agree with you. When he got that rebound, he looked like, oh, I need to get this ball out of my hands as quickly as I possibly can. Um, and just like, you know, just let me call a timeout. Oh, there's no time. Okay, let me, he didn't see it. Okay, I'm just going to dribble. Oh, uh, where? Timeout, timeout. Tom, like, just you've like, been, Tom, you've been on the bench before and we in the meat and potatoes of the game. What's one of the first things the coach says on the bench if we don't have any timeouts? Or we tell him, hey, we got no timeouts. We got no that's, timeouts. No timeouts. That's made yeah. clear before we even go into anything. But I will say this, that's why, but that's my point that uh, you're, you just made my, my point for me a little bit. Yes, absolutely. The, a good coach will tell you, should tell you, Hey, we got no timeouts off or Hey, when we get out there, don't forget the foul. If we miss the ball, like, yeah, they tell you that instruction, whatever it, need, it needs to happen. That doesn't mean you always know. I remember a game where Kobe, I think is guarding someone in the deep wing and he's screaming at his players, foul, foul, foul. We have to stop the clock. And he has to run from the deep corner. You remember it up to the top of the key? I think Vooch was covering or something. No, and Jeremy to, Lin was covering. Jeremy him. Lin. Oh, Jeremy yeah. Lin. Right. And he has to run up and, and, and foul him himself. And he's just like, guys, like, come on. So guys do have moments like that. So here's my theory based on everything that was sent to me. And it was like articles and, and facts that were said to me, like I said, I gave you like this much of this much that I received, which is awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the thing. Here's my theory. I think Ed Martin, Chris Weber, listen, they know each other from the neighborhood. Chris Weber's coming up. He's clearly a phenomenal basketball player. Ed's like, yo, man, you know, a lot of people do this. Like, I, I think everyone who's been any good at any sport has had someone who'd be like, yeah, let's hang out. Let me buy you dinner. Let me do that. I think that's happened to everybody. Right. So I think this is happening. He may or may not. And he knows what Ed does. Let's be honest on the side. But, but, but that's not news. Like, listen, I think all of us, let's not maybe admit too much, but I think all of us have friends or know people who aren't the most straight up individuals. Okay, okay on up and up. I can get yeah, with that. Okay. Yeah, okay. So he's like, hey, that's his business. I'm not getting involved in that. He's giving me stuff, whatever, whatever. But if I'm Ed Martin, so I'm going to put my that mentality on maybe, <clears throat> maybe he's never so i don't believe he's he skimmed or point shaved throughout his career I, that i don't believe i'm going to give it a six let me give you the answer first i'm going to give it a six out of ten and here's okay. why i think it might be possible because i think ed martin was probably smart enough if he's running an illegal gambling ring people want to say he's stupid nah if you're doing stuff like that you're not dumb you're, you're listen you're not putting your your brains in the right direction but you yeah. know you're, you're not a dumb person smart enough to know hey i can get a big payday out of this I'm going to put a bunch of money on UNC. Chris, this is what I need you to do. If you don't, you know the type of guy I am. Mm -hmm. You know the type of people I roll with. Mm -hmm. You're going to be in trouble. Your family's going to be in trouble. Sorry, I, I think that's a, I, I think to say that's on no way that happened. I don't know. I think that's a little naive. I think we know that stuff has happened. So could it happen? All I'm saying is, could it happen? I would say, yes, it could. And the way Chris Weber reacted after. Everyone wants to say, oh, my God, he cost the team and he was crying. He was I, I, Could it be that he felt so guilty that he did it? Did it on purpose that maybe that's why? Or maybe, Tone, he just felt like like he did because I maybe. cost us the game. Maybe. That's why. Maybe. So that's why he I'm giving crushed. it like that middle of the road. Maybe. And I'm, and I'm also thinking 
if he if, if it's very difficult for me to come to you and say, hey, Tom, I need to borrow hundred thousand dollars. Well, we have to get up to that. So, hey, Tom, can I borrow a hundred dollars? Give you a hundred dollars back. Hey, Tom, can I borrow a thousand dollars? Give you a thousand dollars back. Hey, Tom, can I borrow ten thousand dollars? I'll give you ten thousand dollars back. We have to get up to that as opposed to I'm going to go right to you and go, Tom, I need to borrow five hundred grand. But could, I'm not good for that. He could, but listen, the, we don't know. He was giving him money, buying him gifts, doing this. It could have been a little bit, and he's like, "No, I won't do that." A little bit, no, I won't do that. Hey, Chris, this is your last game. You owe me, and if you but don't, it, it wasn't just that though. It wasn't just Weber tone. You do know Jalen Rose said he was giving him dough, so yeah, if he was know, giving it to Jalen Rose. That means that he was giving it to other guys too. It wasn't just those two. We don't. We don't know. Did he? Did he give Jalen that same? That same opportunity, but Weber was the one that got the. And knowing Jalen Rose, and knowing Jalen, if 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 that was going on, it would have came up already. I'm pretty. Yeah, that's proud. yeah, that's the thing about Jalen. I, I, yeah, I, he's the type that would have would have spilled the beans. Get, I agree with you on that. Definitely giving sure. it up. So I'm on the one. I'm on the one. You're, you're on the one. I'm on that. I'm on that teeter of that five six. Like mm -hmm. I don't believe it, but I could see how you could make that case. Mm -hmm. Right. So so let us know what you think. Did Chris mm -hmm. Weber just have a bonehead moment and called two timeouts and traveled <laughs> in five seconds? Or did he purposely try to lose that game for his guy? All right. Then we're gonna switch to the NFL. Speaking of running, speaking of traveling, like he looked like a football player, just run down the court. Um, on, here's our top five. I'm gonna start. Let's I'll just start with number one. Mm -hmm. Let me know where you think. I gotta say this right off the bat. I think the run, the free agent running back class is a little iffy this mm -hmm. this season. So if you need a running back, you might. I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm a little worried about free agency. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Number one, Leonard Fournette. Leonard Fournette. I think that the. I think that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have gotten what they're going to get out of him. Um, I think he's still got some good years left in him. And I do think that he's an NFC running back. Um, a good place for him to be, with that being said, is Tennessee. I'm sorry, not Tennessee. It's Tampa, not Tennessee. I'm sorry. It, no, ten, Tennessee, they already straight with it. Yeah, they, they're good. Is a good place for them to be is Tampa. Even though they've gotten everything that they're going to get out of him. You saw what happened in Jacksonville. I saw what happened when he got to Tampa. I think that they're going to shore up their quarterback situation, and they're I just, think they're going to run it back. So yeah, don't, let's not. People it. think Fournette's old. Fournette's twenty-seven years old. That's it. One hundred and eighty carries last year. Eight mm -hmm. eight hundred yards, eight touchdowns, sixty-nine catches for four hundred and fifty-four yards and two touchdowns. Two years, thirteen million is the projected. So you think he stays in Tampa? I think he stays in Tampa. You know, it's unfortunate. You know, I, I hate this. This you know, the rich keep getting richer, but. You know where we would make sense. They just don't have the cap room to make it happen. Also in the NFC, they just awesome. won the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah, right. Like he'd be that type of guy. Yeah, uh, to help because if they had a little bit of better of a running game, I know Cam Akers with started the you know, with the yeah. injuries, but the Rams made sense. But yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of with you. I think I don't think we're gonna see because I'm trying to think where else could he go. Um. And I just I don't see who's gonna give because he's not, look there's no more featured backs, right? So to take a chance, I'm like, are you getting the Tampa Bay guy? Are you getting the Jacksonville guy? Like I now, think with that being said, Tone, him being in with the except whatever Russell West, whatever Russell Wilson is doing, he'd be really good in Seattle because now that gives them a completely different dynamic that they didn't have. Seattle might be a good one too. Actually, that's yeah. a good idea. All right, mm -hmm. number two, and this one, you know. He's been on a couple of teams who just didn't know how to use him. But, man, Cordero Patterson mm. had a year in Atlanta. But for running backs, he's on that – although he's a running back wide receiver, we don't really know kind of what's where to classify him. He's on that wrong side of 30. So he's 31. Mm. He had 153 carries for 618 yards, <coughs> six, six touchdowns, 52 catches, 548 mm. yards. So he has – about 1,200 all-purpose yards or 1,150, mm -hmm. whatever it is, um, and five TDs catching. He was He's, like – he was really the heart and soul of that Atlanta Falcons offense. Still really good. Still what do, really what good. do we think? 
still really good. Well, there's not a market, not a huge market for a guy on the other side of 30, on a bad team. Now, he could he could end up playing for a different team like Pittsburgh. I think that he could help them in terms of being a third down back. I, to be honest with you, Tone, I remember Corey Dillon went to New – I remember Corey Dillon went to New England. That's kind of giving me those vibes where, you know, Cordell Patterson, I think Belichick could help him. He could help Belichick being the kind of player that he is, a third down back, uh, getting getting out in the flat. I think that he could help New Orleans, New England. I think that he could help them out tremendously. So I think there is some market for him now. And, and on top of that, I think that in New England, he would come for cheap because, I mean, we're not looking at a guy that's, you know, a four-year, $50 right. million dollar deal, $26 million guaranteed. No. I yeah, think the, those the, the projection is one year, ten million. Yeah, and and so I'm, you know, my first thought is Atlanta needs to keep him because he mm-hmm. was the only consistent thing. They still don't, you know, Calvin Ridley. We don't know what's going to be what's going on there. Mm-hmm. Kyle Pitts is a second year tight end, but you know, Matt Ryan's still your quarterback. I don't know they what don't they're have, doing in Atlanta to be they honest. Don't have a quarterback situation. But yeah, but if I'm if I'm Cordero Patterson and I get a call from Bill Belichick and says, hey, here's a you know one year eight million dollar deal, nine million dollar deal. Mm-hmm. You're going to kind of be our featured back because I want to use you in creative ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm taking that call. So, yeah, I, I, li- I like that one. And they're a playoff team, too. Right. Right. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, where was he? Minnesota, Chicago, mm-hmm. Atlanta. Like, I, right. I think he'd like a chance to win. Mm-hmm. Melvin Gordon on the right side of 30, 29. He, you know. I love Melvin Gordon, man. People either love <laughs> Melvin Gordon or hate Melvin Gordon. I love him, yo. So, last season. 203 carries, 918 yards, eight touchdowns. That was like the quietest 900-yard rushing season, I think, ever in the history of football. 28 catches, 213 yards for two more touchdowns. So 10 touchdowns total. Is he, you know, but they have uh, Javante Williams there in Denver. Mm -hmm. Is this something that he sticks around to be that kind of one-two punch? You know, now this is project. Look, I'm just using these ESPN projections, right? We don't know, right? One year, five million. One year, five. So a a team where he could just get on the crew for that one year and push them over the top. We sending them out to the desert, Tom. I think he's perfect. Arizona. And I love him in Arizona. Absolutely. One year, five million, and that team. Because I did Connor. Melvin Gordon's a better running back than Connor. In my, it, it, when, when, from what I see, I think Melvin Gordon is a better running back than Connor. Melvin Gordon reminds me, Tony, you can appreciate this being a Laker fan. He reminds me of Lamar Odom. What do you mean, Lamar Odom? He reminds me of that guy where Lamar Odom will give you something and Tony, he just leaves you starving. Like, give me more. Give me more. That's who Melvin Gordon is. He's a guy who'll run for 160 yards and you thinking, yo, this dude going to be the best running back in the league. And then next week, you get 60 yards out. How are you, just, a seven, how are you a seven foot point guard? Who could dribble, <laughs> shoot, pass, rebound, defend, drop thirty, and now you left-handed two, by the way. And now, and now two Le- points. Left-handed by the way. I Don't leave that yeah. Left-handed by the way. And, then, just, and then you do nothing. Yeah. He just he, he Melvin Gordon is that guy. He just he's a he's one of those running backs who's gritty. I think that him being in Arizona for the one year because they right at the doorstep too, Tone. They're not that far away. They're gonna get Kyler Murray back, right? Not only are they gonna get Kyler Murray back, Hop is gonna be ready. A.J. Green is going to be ready next season, even though I think A.J. Green is washed. But Zach Ertz is going to be better. So I, to, get Melvin, to get Melvin Gordon in that, in that rushing attack, oh, man, I think that he would be great for them. And he comes cheap, too. One year, five million? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, in, the, uh, I'm in the same division, mm-hmm. but not the Cardinals. Let me ask you a question. How many running backs did the 49ers go through last season? Let's see. We had Elijah Mitchell. Uh, three. I think we went through three of them total. He'd be a he'd be a nice stable guy in the backfield in in San Francisco, wouldn't he? He would be, and he comes cheap too. That's the most important part, Tony. And he comes cheap. And the way Shanahan's system is run, it's a uh, run heavy system. Aha! Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. You got it. So here's here's my thing. I'm making my pitch to Melvin and saying, "Hey, listen, you've had it. You've had a career." That's been kind of up and down. Let's be honest. Some, mm-hmm. you know, here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the best kind of running scheme to accentuate your positives. I'm going to give you a team that's run first with solid defense. You know, all my run, my running backs rush for a thousand yards. I don't even care who they are. 
Mm-hmm. I need a durable back who's going to be my number one. And then I'm going to have a couple guys kind of backing you up. I'll, you know, absolutely. You don't want to go to Arizona. What's happening with Kyler Murray? He's asking for a contract. There's, there's some issues over there. We got a young a young quarterback and Trey Lance, who's going to be our starter. We need a veteran guy like you to be that go-to guy in those situations. Who we're going to feature, by the way, we're in gonna, the offense. Who we're gonna, exactly. Uh, I think that's a pretty good pitch, and I think that's a good – because let's be honest, what the only thing San Francisco has lacked really over the last two seasons, because of injuries, mind you, has been consistency defensively and in the running game. Well, here, this might be at least answers one of those things. So I, I like one, one, one of our best running backs was our wide receiver. So stop playing. Your best running back was your <laughs> now. That's listen, uh, Debo. Listen, it's not a, that's not a bad thing. But. That's not terrible. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's not, not terrible. terrible. All right, number four. You actually just mentioned him. Is James Conner? Who, by the way, why do I feel like James Conner's old? He's twenty seven. I feel like he's been in the league for ten years. <laughs> well, one Arizona. He's, I think he's been in Arizona for, for, for his entire career. I don't think he's been. No, anywhere. no, he was in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. He was in Pittsburgh. I'm sorry. I forgot about he was, Pittsburgh. He took over for, uh, remember, yeah. um, Le'Veon Bell. And that's him. why. And he had a great, that first season he took over for yes. Le'Veon Bell. We forgot right. Bell that mm-hmm. fast. Yes. Of James Conner. Yeah. I'll tell you what, Tom. How about we go back to Pittsburgh? Well, let me give you his stats. So 202 carries last year for 739 yards. Mm-hmm. Fif- 15 touchdowns. He was great on my fantasy team, by the way. He was my flex. I'm sure that you was a steal. Up. I'm sure um, you up that. <laughs> 30, 37 catches, 375 yards, three touchdowns. So he's, again, a, around 1,000 all-purpose yards, 18, 18, let me say this again, 18 touchdowns. Mm-hmm. And you think, go back to Pittsburgh? Well. Two years. Oh, let me give you the project. The project. Two year, 10 million. Two years, 10 million. So well, just to, could... to recap it, right, to put it into perspective, mm-hmm. one year 10 for Cordero, one year five for Melvin Gordon, two year 10, again, projected. Right. So him being in Arizona, two years, I think they're going to pay Kyler Murray. And I like Melvin Gordon in Arizona. Okay. I think I think that they st- – especially because I think that's an upgrade, to be honest with you. And I like Connor, but I think Melvin Gordon's a better running back. Um, I think I think Melvin Gordon's a better running back. I mm-hmm. think James Conner is a better all around like receiver too out of the backfield. So Saturday let's stay in that, so let's stay in that division tone because the Super Bowl champs need a running back. And for two but, years but they're over the cap. They are over the cap. That's not gonna work. Mm-mm. Nope. That's not gonna work. So the Rams are out. So if you look at the NFC East, I think the Giants are gonna move off of Saquon Barkley, Tone. I think that they're gonna move off of him. Really? Yeah, I do. I think that they're going to move off okay. of him. So I wouldn't be surprised if they were in the market for Connor. That would not surprise me at all. I am going to throw. I, I, listen, I don't know the I don't know the salary cap situation for this team, but I'm going to throw one out to you because here's a team that probably had a chance at the AFC Championship last year. They're only going to get better this year in, in their minds, mm-hmm. and one of their kind of question marks all season although they did play well later on mm-hmm. is the buffalo bills jo- josh allen with a guy who can run the ball a little bit catch out of the backfield a little bit be a little bit more consistent mm-hmm. a little bit more dynamic right than Jack Moss <coughs> and devin mm-hmm. singletary I-, I think that over one of those two guys i think he's an upgrade and and that's c- kind of that guy like you know a guy who can get into the end zone because josh allen as great as he is when he needs to get out and run you don't want your quarterback doing that. So yeah. to have someone who can clearly get into the end zone, right, has mm-hmm. a nose for the end zone, as the scouts would say, yep. I think that's a nice addition for the Bills. And then to add to that, I'll give you one more team where they are run heavy. And I like Connor in Baltimore because I think that he takes the pressure off of Lamar Jackson. I think he gives them a completely different dynamic. And two years, $10 million, he comes cheap. Not only does he come cheap, he gives them a dynamic that they didn't have in terms of the running back. And now that means Lamar can throw the ball more than he did in the past. And I think that opens up their offense even more. I think he helps them out tremendously. The only question mark I have with Baltimore, if why I would say maybe they wouldn't sign him. Mm -hmm. If J.K. Dobbins is back, I think we forget how good he can be when healthy. 
he, hey, how, say, say, say the last healthy. part. Uh, yeah, okay. and, uh, that's what okay. I said, when healthy. So mm-hmm. maybe that's the insurance policy. You're absolutely right. All right. We're going to stick in Arizona with, I don't know if I want to call him his backup, but the other running back in Arizona. Chase Edmonds, 26, 116 carries, 586 yards, two touchdowns, but that's probably because James Conner stole them all. 43 catches, 311 yards. Um, he's like, All these guys are about $5 million a year, so he his projected contract is three years, $15 million. So we're looking at about $5 million a year for almost all these guys. Where do we see a guy like Chase Edmonds? Is Chase a backup, or, or is, he a, is he a lead ball carrier? That's my question. Is he a guy that I can get a ball to 15, 20 times a game? That's my – because if he's that guy, then – as a young guy, <clears throat> excuse me, as a young guy, if he's that guy, we could build around him with Daniel Jones and, and he could be with the Giants. Because, Tony, I think that the Giants are going to move off of Saquon Barkley. I don't think they're confident in him being healthy. And I think they're going to move off of him. So, for the Giants to look at a guy like that and maybe be a feature back, the question is, is, is he a feature back? Baltimore is another team. But your team, which is the most important one that I was thinking about, my quarterback can't be my leading rusher. That can't happen. I need a guy in the backfield who can run the football. So to have a guy like this where we could feature him and giving him, giving him the ball 15, 20 times a game, I like it, Tone, in Buffalo. You like him in Buffalo? Okay. I like him in Buffalo. Yeah, I, it, I feel like he's going to end up in Arizona. He's going to just stay in Arizona. I mm-hmm. think I, I think a lot of these guys are going to stay. However, I think Chase is the one that moves. I think him and James Conner, I don't think that's a good – like if I want a backfield, I don't think that's a good good mix. Like I want a power back. Like I really like – like I'll, I'll give the example the Packers. I really like what they have in, in Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. You got kind of the all-purpose back in Jones, and then you got the bruiser in A.J. Dillon, like short right. yardage – Third down goal line, mm-hmm. he he'll like you know thighs the size of Mack trucks. Like you know those, that's the kind of guy I like to have as my kind of alternate. Or if I have a big bruising back, then mm-hmm. I want kind of that scat back receiving mm-hmm. back as the alternate. So I like to have them to be very different type of players. Well, you can't have that guy anymore, Tone. You can't have the one guy who's just the primary ball carrier who's just a bruiser because he's not going to hold up. Right, he's but that's why gonna... you, that's listen. We're all committee backs now for for the most right. part. There's a couple of exceptions, but they're, they're, for the most part. So I think Chase Edmonds kind of fits a lot of places, right? Like all the teams we mentioned, like the Seattle's, the Buffalo's, Baltimore's. Mm-hmm. I because I, I don't think he's a I don't think he's a feature back. I don't think he's your number one. I think right. he's a number two. So I think he can literally go and be the number two anywhere. Like he can go to Tennessee, and I know they like their backup there, but I mean he can go into Tennessee and back up, you know, and, and give Derrick Henry. Uh, Derrick Henry a rest. Mm-hmm. He can like literally like anywhere. That. But, I, you know, it depends. Here's the thing that we we don't talk about. We always think of scheme, system, those types of things. But where do they want to go, right? Like, right. where's Chase Edmonds from? Does he want to go to a winning franchise? Does he want to go, mm-hmm. like, does he want to go to, maybe he wants to go to the Patriots. Be like, mm-hmm. hey, I want to win 10, 11 games, right? And, <clears throat> you know, and have a chance in the playoffs, right? Mm-hmm. Although it, Arizona's on the step, uh, you know, they made the playoffs this year. But so those are the other things we don't think about. But I think mm-hmm. he's the type of back where he's not going to be your featured back. So it literally can go anywhere. So if I have to pick somewhere, I think he stays in Arizona. Okay. I think and backs up whether it's like you said, whether it's Melvin Gort. Who knows? You you keep saying they want to get uh, the Giants want to get rid of Saquon. Well, maybe that's the splash that the, the Cardinals make from Kyler Murray is here's your paycheck plus we're gonna get you a guy who has superstar running back potential and bring in Saquon mm-hmm. and have Chase as his back. So there's some opportunities. All right. Any, is there any other running backs that kind of come to mind that you're like, oh, we didn't talk about, we really should talk about this guy? Like, I don't know, Shoney Michelle, Rashard Penny, any of those guys, or we good? No, I think we're good. Yeah, it's, I like Sony Michelle too. And I, and not only do I like him, I think he stays in New England. I don't think he moves. Um, uh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles. You, yeah. He used to be in, he wasn't New England. He wasn't doing yeah. I, I do that all the time. I do. Um, so, all right. So that's, those are our five running backs. Let us know if there's a running back we missed that you want to know, or if you disagree with any of our top five running backs, where they should go. We're going to head back to basketball, but this time not college. We're going to uh, drop to the NBA. And I got to start off by saying, you wanted to talk about this guy, and rightfully so. But I watched him get drafted, grow in the NBA, grow as a player. Mm Mm-hmm. Saw his strengths, saw his weaknesses, mm-hmm. shed a tear, 
when he got traded, but understood why when he got traded to San Antonio mm-hmm. from the, his beloved Toronto Raptors. One of the few players who's like Toronto, like an L.A. Compton kid coming to Toronto, mm-hmm. saying, this is my home. This is where I want to be. When nobody else was saying, this is where I want to be and sign, re-signing and then getting yeah. traded. He had no intentions of ever going anywhere else. He would have he he played 14, 15 years in Toronto and retired up there. It, it was heartbreaking. Again, however, I, I get it. They had to do it. Mm-hmm. So he goes to San Antonio. It's not it's not bad. It's not like he did poorly in San Antonio, but San Antonio was not the same San Antonio Spurs team that we knew. Mm-hmm. He now ends up in Chicago. I'm just going to run through here. So in 58 games this season, 35 minutes a game, 35.7 minutes a game, just mm-hmm. over 28 points a game, just over five rebounds a game, five mm-hmm. assists. So he's putting up 28, five and five with a steal. Um, and, and, and I don't know. Do you care about PER 24.91? I don't know that I care about mm-hmm. PER. However, more importantly, more importantly, he's got the bulls sitting at 39 and 23. And we, you know, we questioned where the Bulls would be this season because we knew their offense would be good, but we weren't mm-hmm. sure about their defense, right? Well, he, they're actually playing pretty well defensively. As, you know, they're second in the East. Um, what do you think about DeMar DeRozan and his MVP chances? Plus, the tricky thing here is, Tom, whenever you're talking about a league MVP, you know, you, you you bow up like, yo, this guy is this, this guy. It's DeMar DeRozan, and we saw DeMar DeRozan in San Antonio. We saw DeMar DeRozan in Toronto. Nobody's really screaming about him. And it's exactly what I said to you a while ago, that it's a conversation that we have to have. This isn't something that, yeah, DeMar DeRozan is in the league MVP. Well, wait a minute, man. I think he leads all guards in scoring. That's number one. I think he leads all guards in scoring. He's had that team at the top of the Eastern Conference who've been decimated by injury. And he's he's held them together. And the Eastern Conference has been so much better this year than last year. And when I think about DeMar DeRozan being a free agent, I think about DeMar DeRozan being a free agent coming into, coming into the Chicago Bulls. Anybody who tells me that they had DeMar DeRozan as a potential MVP of the league, I promise you, you and I will never have a conversation because you're lying. You are <laughs> so, absolutely lying. So DeMar DeRozan, fourth <clears throat> in the league in scoring. He only trails Joel Embiid, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and LeBron James. He leads all guards in score. He's he's fourth. I think he might be listed as a small forward right now. But yes, right. he's, he's a shooting guard. I, right. I don't care what they list him as. He's he a shooting guard. Eight yeah, years in Toronto, he played yeah, the two. He plays the two. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not listening to that small yeah. forward nonsense. So with that being, with, with all of that being said, Tom, the downside to this is he's got a guy on his team that's doing something similar to him, and that's Zach Levine. Yep. So Demar Derozan's averaging 28. The Rosen's averaging. I'm not. I'm, the Rosen's averaging 28. Zach Levine is averaging 25. Now you got the other league MVP candidates. Nobody. I think Giannis is 28 and 12 and six. Nobody on, in Milwaukee's doing that, right? Joel Embiid is, I think he leads the league in scoring. He, he, and I, correct, he does. I think he leads the league in scoring, and I think he's in the top 10 in rebounding. Joel has nobody on his team that's doing that. He just got James Harden. He was doing that before James Harden showed up. Sure. James, on the other hand, he's not in the conversation because the Lakers are trash, right? The Lakers are bad, so he's not in the conversation. So that leaves DeMar DeRozan. That leaves Joel Embiid, Giannis himself and i believe chris paul got hurt so john moran is now in the conversation but i i i I think that we have to talk more about him than we did simply because how he's held that team together and when you think about a league mvp right when you think about a league mvp it's the most valuable to your team's success Mm -hmm. chicago both been at the top of the eastern conference the entire season and they've been at the top of the eastern conference the entire season primarily because of him. So it's absolutely a conversation, and he is in it. I think what happens is he's been in the league so long, and we've never actually talked about him as an MVP candidate I don't that I can remember. Ever. Ever, right? Ever. And we look at Toronto, and people always, every time I bring up DeMar DeRozan, they're like, okay, well, he wasn't a great defender. 
Okay, he wasn't a great defender. I, I agree, he wasn't. Although, how many people are great defenders nowadays? Anyways, that's a different can't, conversation. Can't, can't say that I saw a Joker's name on all league defensive teams. So. Uh, exactly. So, so he wasn't a great defender. Oh, what about what happened in the playoffs? He choked against LeBron. I always shake my head when people say that or scream. Uh, it's just because, well, listen, LeBron James went to eight and and the Heat and Cavs went to eight straight finals. So to say that hey, he got clamped down and didn't play well and lost. Well, okay. Who didn't? <laughs> Everybody did. But MVP is not a playoff award. No, it is not. It's not a playoff award. So did he play? So I think he goes through all those years in Toronto where he's not really viewed as this superstar. He's just, hey, he's a really good player up there. Goes to San Antonio. And I'm not saying he played poorly, but just the team didn't have success, so we didn't really talk about him. So now he goes to Chicago where, hey, now people are watching. People are paying mm-hmm. attention to Chicago. Oddly enough, Toronto's a bigger city, but anyways, different conversation for another time. By, by the way. <laughs> conversation for another time. Um, so these are Chicago media. They're looking at him, right? And he's doing stuff, right? Like he's doing stuff that just hasn't been done that. Like I believe, I don't know if it's changed, but eight straight games of 35 plus points and 50% shooting better from the field. Only seven players. Let me list you the players who have done this. So obviously DeMar. Mm-hmm. LeBron, mm-hmm. James Harden, Elgin Baylor. Where is Stop right there. Go from the top again. One more, one, one more. So DeMar DeRozan. Okay. LeBron James. League MVP. James Harden. League MVP. Elgin Baylor. Okay. Wilt Chamberlain. League MVP. Kobe Bryant. League MVP. Michael Jordan. League MVP. Five of the seven guys. That That's... Who was who? Hold on, just I thought Elgin was the only one. Oh, and Demar. All right, yeah, fine. and Demar. No, Demar. So, we we don't know if he's going to win it, yeah, but we, we we'll, take, we'll take Demar off it. So six of the seven guys are league MVPs. Yeah, five five of the other five of the other six. And Elgin Baylor. Yeah. Let's be let's be serious. Let, like he probably should have had one, but anyways, that's a conversation for another day. I'm a Laker fan. Um, so he's not. So not only is he leading a team to number two seed in the East, mm-hmm. he's top five in scoring. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's doing things, like I said, that haven't been done, but we're Mm -hmm. still not talking about him. We have guys like, we have guys like Joker. We talk about him, even though his team isn't doing that well. Uh, we have guys like John Morant who, well, he's never done it before. And Mm -hmm. the Mars numbers are better. And when jaws out of the lineup and you know, jaws, my like second favorite player in the league right now, next to Giannis, Mm -hmm. um, jaws team won without him. Mm Mm-hmm. I think, what did they go? What did you tell me before? 10 and 2, 10 and 1, 12 and it's like some crazy number mm-hmm. without him. Um, who else? Who else? Well, we're not talking LeBron because his team might not even make the playoffs, not even the play in. Chris, Chris, pa- Chris, pa- Chris Paul's hurt. Chris Paul's hurt and probably mm-hmm. Joel Embiid and Giannis. So I still mm-hmm. think Joel and Giannis are the, are the top two guys right now. I think Joker's out of the conversation. I don't think he's in. No, the I think his team's not, his team's not there. Mm-hmm. So even, <clears> listen, <throat> technically, if you want to be strict, and I know this is not 100%, but typically it's a team that has a, a first-round home series in the playoffs. Right now, Giannis and the Bucks are fifth. And I know a lot of that has to do with the way they started this season. So he's but, out too. So he's so just, just don't, he, we're only one year removed of him winning back-to-back. Mm-hmm. So now you got a guy who's already won two, mm-hmm. and his team's fifth. He might be out of – it might be – Joel and DeMar. DeMar, DeMar DeRozan, yep. Yeah. Because KD is out, Chris Paul is out. So these these two guys, when you think about most valuable to their team's success, these guys are at the top of the list. And that's what this is all about. Me and you have had this conversation, Tone, since 1975-76. That's been 46 years. There have only been two guys who have won the league MVP and been on teams that have finished lower than three. Because every 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 MVP since then has been number three, has been on a team that has been three or higher. That's it. So it's only been two guys. That's Russ in the 16-17 season, and that's Jabbar in the 75-76 season. Every other league MVP has been on a team that has either been the yeah. one, two, or the three seed. And for the record, look at what those guys did in those two seasons, and you'll know why. There, those those were the exceptions to the rule. So I don't think there's going to be an exception to the rule. So I th- listen. I still think I've told you this for weeks now. I think it's unless something happens to Embiid and he gets hurt, mm-hmm. or I don't know if Harden 
just takes over and he starts averaging 20 a game, you know, to end out the season for the last 20 games. Nah. I think it's I think it's Joel's to lose. Mm-hmm. But if DeMar doesn't finish second or third, Max. He's definitely a top three candidate. No I, question I think about. I think, yeah, I think we're something something someone did something wrong there. Yeah. So let me so let me ask you this. And let me ask everyone in the comments as well. Is DeMar DeRozan your league MVP? No, I think it's Joel Embiid. I think it's Joel. I I, I, think it's I, I can't go against what I've been saying, so I'm with you. I yeah. think it's Joel, but I think I think Demar should be second. I think I, it's not it's not Joel Embiid like like how you tell me tone about Matt Stafford and Jared Goff like this. No, it's Joel Embiid and it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. Demar Derozan like this. So, all right, you know what it's time for. Bill, bro. Question number one. We're sticking in the NBA. Uh oh. We didn't mention his name in the MVP conversation. Although, if you look at just stats, he probably should be. Is Luka Doncic the future of the NBA? If I think Giannis is the future of the NBA, I have to say that Luka is the future of the NBA because of how he brings what. Because of what he brings to the game, you know, Jason Kidd challenged him. Before the season started, Tom, not, not before the season started, when the season started, you and I had this conversation. My big gripe on him was he was doughy. He was out of shape. He just didn't look sharp. Jason Kidd challenged him. You got to get in better shape. You have to be more of a playmaker. You got to be more a distributor. You got to be more of a team guy. And he did that. Not only did he do that, he got snubbed as an all-star starter. As an all-star starter, he got snubbed. And went 29 and 9 since then. Now, we're not really talking too much about Dallas. And the reason why we're not talking too much about Dallas is because they've done a terrible job at building around him. They have. And I'm, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. You have a you have an A player in Dallas. You don't have an A player, you don't have a B player having an A year. You have an A player in Dallas, and you got a franchise player. Luca is not a cornerstone. Luca is not a guy that who is a piece. No, Luca is the guy that you go. I'm building my unit around him. I think Dallas has done a, a, a less than average job of doing that. But as a player, he is definitely one of the faces of the league. After Luka, who does Dallas have? Luka leads his team in points, 27.6. Rebounds, 9.2. Assists, an 8.9. Like, uh, who's their, their second best guy is Brunson. Because it's not Hardaway, right? It's not Finney Smith. They already traded away KP. So it's essentially, it kind of reminds me of what they did in Cleveland where, you know, we're just going to keep getting back to the playoffs and we'll just see what happens. And then this guy goes off in the playoffs like he does. And then there's no success. And that's how he's viewed. I think that Dallas needs to do a better job at building around him. His numbers will suffer if they were to get him better players that's what you talked about to me a little while ago, Tone. That's what sacrifice is. I got better players. So that means that I don't have to do nearly as much. So let me answer the question quickly, and then I'll explain. Is Luka Doncic the future of the NBA, the face of the NBA? The answer is no. Mm. The answer is no. And here's why the answer is no. If I think back, I think of the NBA in the 60s, and I think Wilt and Russell. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, I think Jabbar and others, mm -hmm. but just when I think of who the face of the French. In the 80s, we know <clears throat> Magic and Larry saved the NBA. No one was watching the NBA. In the 90s, it was Mike. Mm -hmm. In the early 2000s, it was Shaq, Kobe. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying those two, these guys are the greatest players of each of those, although I think they are too, but you know, because people say, oh, what about Tim Duncan? Tim Duncan wasn't the face of the franchise. No one, like he just, he went out and won, but he wasn't the face. So it was Shaq, it was Shaq and Cole. 2010s, LeBron. Mm -hmm. You can kind of put a face almost to every decade of that one or two players. Here's what I love about the NBA right now in the 2020s. Look how many mid 20 year olds, either superstars already or budding superstars we have. Luca, Ja. Embiid, Giannis, Tatum, Trey. I I'm missing uh, Booker. Um, I know I'm missing. I know I'm missing a ton of guys. Joker. But the list, Joker. 
there's mm-hmm. a list of like 15, 15 guys who Donovan Mitchell. I don't think any one of them is light years ahead of the other. Now we can make lists and say, here's my top five, here's my top three, and, and we'll rank them. Mm-hmm. But like, is there one player who's like LeBron? He's just the best player in the game, undoubtedly. No. Is there a player like in the 90s that, look, Jordan's just the best player? Right. No. Bird and Magic. The, look, every, there's other great players, but the, right now, I don't think that there's one who stands. I think there's more parity, I guess, when it comes to superstars. So this isn't saying Luca's not great. It's just that is he light years ahead of anybody else? So that's yeah. why I just say he's he'll be maybe the answer is yeah he's one of the faces of the future NBA right one Let of me because, because I think it's going to be like four or five you know people that we look at. Let me ask you this, Tone. Would the NBA make a Euro the face of the league? Okay. You're going to get me a really, you're going to get me in trouble with this answer. Uh Um, (laughs) Because I would would say if I'm looking strictly demographics and I'm just talking numbers as a Mm -hmm. take your own ideologies out of this, which I try to do, Mm -hmm. 70 plus percent of the NBA fans are white. The guys who pay for tickets, buy merchandise, do that stuff. So why not? You got to market. You got to market to your audience, right? I, I, mm-hmm. I, like I'm again. I'm taking. Don't you know? I don't want to get in trouble. I'm just. If you just look at demographics, that's from a strictly business standpoint. And I'm t- you know me. I'm in a lot of business meetings. Yes, sir. And and we have to have these conversations. Yes. We have to have. You know, there's reasons why when I'm in Texas. Right, the sign outside of the business says "Si sí, habla español," because you got to know who your customers are. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a reason why if you go to the Danforth in Toronto now, not as much today as it used to be, but however, you don't know this. This is gonna be news to you. It's that's Greek town. All the signs are in Greek because guess mm-hmm. what? That's a lot of the people. That's what they're going for. They're going for that experience. You go to Little mm-hmm. Italy. You go any of those types of. You have to know who your audience is. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think, I think they would. Yeah. But huh? here's the problem. Here's the problem. And this is the other reason why I got to say, Luca, no. Your team has to be good. You yeah. have to win. I don't see them winning a chip. Like, mm-hmm. he might be like Dirk. Like, think about it. Dirk would have been another great, great player, great. But he only won one chip and went on, like, a historic run to do it. If you're not going to be a multiple champion. So that that's my other part. When you look at the NBA today, who do you see is going to win? Do you see any team? Forget forget three Pete. Do, do you have anybody who might back to back the Bucks? Maybe, maybe, right? Maybe this year the Bucks could go back to back. I think that they are going to be in the NBA Finals. But when you're talking about going on a Kobe Shaq run, going on a Jordan run, where you know six titles in eight years, uh, heck, even San Antonio going on a four and eight, <clears throat> four right? Seven, Stuff like that. I don't see any team like that. And the reason why we don't see any teams like that right now, Tone, is because the player movement. You know. Don't forget, Jordan played with the right. Bulls for as long as he did. Kobe and Shaq were together eight years, right? So I don't really see teams that stay together that long. There's this small window where teams stay together. Look, two, it's four or five three. years, right? That's four, it. A four-year window, maybe. And, yeah. and then that's it. I mean, what Golden State did, that's that's an anomaly. I don't think that that's but, something, but even, as listen, you would say. Even, even Golden State, if you think about it, mm-hmm. their core team that they had of Steph, Draymond, and Clay mm-hmm. went to the finals – Twice, won one, lost one. Mm-hmm. Then they got Kevin Durant, mm-hmm. and then they went to three three straight finals, won two, lost one. Yeah, and then the team was done. So as much as we'll say, okay, in five years they won three, I'm sorry, those are two very different teams. Not the, the same team. The, the Draymond Clay Steph team versus the Draymond Clay Steph KD. Those are right. two two different teams. I get it. It was, but if you look at the supporting cast, right, it was different. Right, absolutely. But still, that's still what three, three and five, three and five years. That's that's amazing. But I mean, going to the NBA Finals five straight years and winning it three times—that's that's pretty that's impressive. Inc- that's incredible. Mm-hmm. That is How, that's really when are we going to see that again? Do you think another superstar is going to go to a seventy-win team, and 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 deal with what KD had to deal with? I don't know. I don't know if they're going to do. It. So that's what I'm lot. saying is that you know it's it's going to be tough for Luca to be that face because I just I don't think Dallas. I'm looking at their roster now. Uh, unless they shake, they're not paying anybody, Tone. That's the problem. Not only are they not paying anybody, they don't. They're scouting. To, when have they? When have they? With the exception of Luca, 
drafting Luca. When did they but hit? They, they didn't draft Luca. Well, they traded for. They drafted they Trey, See, they and still, then they, they traded. Still didn't even. Tra- right. So, I just think that they're doing a terrible job with him, man. I just do. Yeah. So, so that's my thing. Is that's why I think is I think there's too many other people competing. I don't think he's gonna win enough chips to be the face. Like again, when I go back to Magic and Bird, what made that rivalry great was mm-hmm. one, it started in college. Mm-hmm. Two, both guys won rings, won MVPs. Right throughout throughout those years, they were they they were also on the top two teams. Dallas right now what sits at five, five. Which last year they was at six. The year before that they were at five. So they're a middle of the road team. And when you're talking about being the face of the league. Of, of, of all the things that you do, how great of a player you are, the reason why Jordan was the face of the league, as good as the player he was, Bulls were winning. The reason right. why Kobe, the reason why Kobe and Shaq were the face of the league, because the Lakers were winning. The reason why LeBron James was the face of the league for all of those years, because he was winning and people wanted to see him lose. That's very important. Luca, as good as a player as he is, to see this team be middle of the road, it's going to be difficult. Let's look. Let's. Look. Let me put it into perspective. The first four or five years of Jordan's career, he was still the best player in the game, but he wasn't getting the, oh, my God, he's the face of the franchise in the 80s nobody, because – Nobody cared, so – Because they weren't winning. Nobody cared. LeBron. Okay, he went to the finals in 07, but would you have said LeBron was clear-cut the face of the league? No, it was Kobe. It was yeah. – it was mm-hmm. other, heck, I think even KG might have been a bigger star at one point. Mm-hmm. But why? Well, because the Cavs weren't winning. Mm-hmm. Right? It's It takes that – once he, even like I said, that 07, and then he doesn't make the finals again. No, once that kind of 11, 12, 13, 14, when he goes on eight straight to eight straight finals, oh, now we're like, oh, yeah, okay, he's the guy, he's the favorite. Or, or maybe two or three straight. We don't even no, have yeah. to go for yeah, that. Yeah, you're right. When, when, when Miami goes to maybe that third one, right. you're like, okay, he now he's the guy. Right. Um, so that's what I'm saying. So, Luca, Luca, you can be the best player and not mm-hmm. the face of the league just because. Right? Is anyone saying Luke is the best player right now? I'm not. But statistically, man. Yeah. But y- your team has to win. So a long time on that question. I'm, uh, I hope that gives you your answer. All right. Here we go. Oh, we're going back to running backs. Are running backs undervalued slash underappreciated now in the NFL? No, I don't think so. And the reason why is because the offense has changed. It's a throwing league. So, in fact, not only that, not only are they – not undervalued, they're overvalued. Well, what do you mean they're overvalued? Tony, you say this to me all the time about the exception. So for every Derrick Henry, right, every Jonathan Taylor, you got middle of the road, third down backs who get overpaid, who aren't going to be able to hold up. And they're only good for two years, three years, as opposed to you building it around your quarterback and you building it around a high octane throwing offense. A guy like Derrick Henry, a guy like Jonathan Taylor, that's the exception to the rule right there. So you don't see guy, you don't see, you don't see running backs getting paid five years, eight years, like they did years ago. And the reason why is because they don't hold up. Add that to the fact that the offense has changed so much that it's now a throwing league. So I don't think that they're undervalued. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say this because because you're right. I think they do get some big paydays. Um, I will say that running backs are accurately valued and accurately appreciated. I'll say that because I don't think we talk about them enough, but I think they do. They're still getting their paydays. But I will say this. I think the running game is underappreciated and undervalued. And what I mean by that is I think the backs themselves, I think we look at them and say, wow, they're great. They get paid, like I said. Um, But their careers are short. But I think the position is still very important. Mm-hmm. If you look at all the best teams in the NFL, with some exceptions, but overall, the best teams throughout the years, they all have a running game. All the best quarterbacks, look at all the best quarterbacks who typically have the best, you know, most yards, most completion percentages, those types of what do they have? They have a good running game that allows them to create play action. Play action is still the best way to get your quarterback a g- nice clean pocket and an opportunity to, to find a receiver and throw it. So I think the 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 player itself maybe not undervalued or underappreciated, but I think the running game itself is. We mm-hmm. never talk about the running game. You know, we look at the Rams and we say, well, look, the Rams won a won a Super Bowl without a running game. And I say this, well, until came, Cam Cam Makers came back. If you look at the end of the season, 
Matt Stafford didn't look as great. Just the threat of the run. Cooper Cup, who runs a three-yard slant. That I know it's a throw. That's a run. That, that's their equivalent. Like the West Coast offense you're familiar with in San Francisco. A lot of those short passing just kind of took over for, for a run. I, I look at Aaron Rodgers. He's got a great running game. Sets up his play action. Like just look at the games where those types of things, all those quarterbacks. So I think we we forget how important the running game is. The Bengals got into the Super Bowl by beating the Chiefs. What was the most important part of that game late in that game, like overtime? Joe Mixon. Joe Mixon, right? Running the ball because that when they're tired, when they're, you know, they're just, they're trying, they need to stop. Well, mm-hmm. you throw that back right up the middle, right? Because mm-hmm. people always ask me, like, why do why you run a halfback dive 20 times a game for one yard, negative one yard, one yard? Ne- I said one, because you need to have the threat of a run. And two, the linemen get tired. So in the fourth quarter, that one-yard halfback dive turns into a 10-yard first down. Mm-hmm. And the clock, as my guy Chris Berman used to say, tick, 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 tick. And that's what you – so you. I think we undervalue how important a running game is. Because I'll tell you this, if you have a solid running game and defense, you still win in this league. Right? And I also now, think too, Tom, I also think that the running back has been somewhat of a dinosaur – what I mean when I say that tone is guys like Walter Payton, like the workhorse back, the guy who's going to run for you for eight, right. ten years. That dude is gone. Yeah, that's right? gone. Yeah, that guy is gone. And the reason why people have questions like this is because that guy is gone. We haven't seen that guy anymore. So now you get guys rotating in and out of in and out of the lineup, in and out of teams, and we've gone to the two back system. Now that we've gone to the two back system, the running back isn't valued nearly as much. Yeah, I agree. All right, last question. <clears throat> this has nothing to do with sports. Mm. And this comes from one of our female viewers. So thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I picked the question and I laughed and then I was like, oh, no, I'm going to change it. And I'm like, no. And then I went back and forth on this, but I'm going to ask it anyways. I don't know. Again, I, this, this episode might be getting me in trouble. How do I find a good man that will treat me right? Hmm. How do you find a good man that'll treat you right? Well, the first thing that one one of the things that <laughs> one of the things when it's I think about one. well, when I think about guys, contrary to popular belief, we're not as complex as as females may think that we are. We're very we're, we're simple. We're simple. Yeah, I agree. we're not we're not as complex as as females think that we are. Find a guy. How do you find a guy? By understanding what guys need and understanding what they want and catering to an ego. Catering to an ego is very important. Being able to cook, that's very important. Presenting yourself in a respectable way, right? That's also important. Being smart because as fine as you can be, Tone, you and I both have had this conversation. You can see a woman who looks like a dime in her face. She is absolutely stunning. The minute she opened her mouth, it looked like somebody hit on her face with a frying pan. You're like, oh my God. So being smart is very important. You know, having, being interesting. Things like that are very important as opposed to, you know, you just shutting up and doing everything that a man says. No, that that's, that's not something that's going to get you to where you need to go with a guy. So yeah, that, that'll get you a man. Look, doing all that will get you a man, but the yep. one that'll treat you right, he probably won't treat you right if you just succumb right. and, or like that. You do need to challenge a little bit. So I'll say this. Mm-hmm. My best answer that I can come up with is set your level of expectations accordingly. Mm-hmm. So here's what I mean. And I hear this a lot, right? I want a guy that's over six foot tall, who makes six figures, who drives a nice car, who has a big house, who's going to take care of me. Um, well, what do you bring to the table? Uh, do, you, do you have a high school degree? No. Do you have a job? I work at the Piggly Wiggly. Uh, I make minimum wage. All right. Do you have a car? No. Do you have a house? No. So <laughs> you don't have any of those things and you just want someone who has all those things. Mm-hmm. Here's the other yeah. part. It depends how old you are. Like if you're 22 and you're expecting a guy who is going to be fit, have six pack abs, make six figures, have his own house. Have his, where does he get the time, first of all, <laughs> to do all this stuff? So it's just like set that level, that bar of expectations. You know, Steve Harvey, Steve Harvey, I got I to gotta shout him out because he said this. It was really funny. He goes, You want someone to treat you right? 
You want you want a man to be there with you every single day and treat you right? Find an ugly man. <laughs> He'll appreciate you like nobody's business. So I'm not suggesting do that. However, I say set your level of expectations. Understand who you are and mm-hmm. what you bring to the table. And also understand what you want to do. So there's 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 a couple of different levels, right? There's guys that are done and they're made. And you're going to have to bring a certain level of made to the to that relationship because if they're already up here well why they're going to look for someone down here they're not they want someone on their level or you can be hey i'm middle of the road i'm going to find someone who's middle of the road a little bit above or hey i'm going to take a project there's nothing wrong with the project there's nothing i know plenty of very happy women right now who found their man maybe at their lowest and said what do you want and he was like, this is what I want to do. These are my dreams. These are my aspirations. And was like, I'm going to help you. Because I, I listen, this is not cliche to say. Behind every successful man is a smart, strong, incredible woman. And so you can, you can be, or hey, for every successful woman, I don't know that there's a successful, there's a man, but maybe, maybe you're the one that's going to be. This is 2022. Maybe yeah. you're going to be the success. I, again, I don't know who's asking this question other than she said, I'm a female and that's what I'm looking for. Um, maybe you're the success and what you need is a man to be there for you. And maybe you need a man to cook and clean and be at home while you go out and and and, and put in work. That's okay. That's okay. Not ridiculous. So it's not it's not ridiculous. ridiculous in this day and age. It's not, you know, we talk about the 50s. You know, mm-hmm. brought, uh, Bill not Russell. Ridiculous. It's not those days where you're sitting at home and, you know, Mrs. Cleaver <laughs> cleaning the table waiting for... Uh, uh, well, I don't even remember Mr. Cleaver's name right now. Mr. Haskell, Buddy Haskell, and those. <laughs> hey, <laughs> leave it to Mr. Beaver. <laughs> leave it to Beaver. Like it's not like that anymore. So, so the best. So, I guess in in one sentence, if I had to answer, how do I find a good man to treat me right? Set your level of expectations to what you can provide. Um, one line. How do you answer that question in one line? How do you answer that question in one line? How would you How would you summarize what you said? Be who you are. That's how you find a man. Be who, Be you, who are. you are. And you will attract what you are. That's a good one. All right. Well, that's it. I love the questions, even though I struggled through that last one. Um, we are going to be back on Friday. Friday. Mm-hmm. Woo. I questioned. I put a question out and I said, other than s- offense scoring, what, what does Kevin Durant do great? And it blew up. On Friday... We're going to ask the question, is he really one of the greatest scorers? But until then, take it light, but take it.